Who's ready to receive a word tonight? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We're ready to hear from you. We're ready to receive. And we pray that tonight would be a night, God, that you would ignite our hearts for discipleship, ignite our hearts to start growing and following you. We will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. As you're seated, look at someone and say, you're never going to be the same again. I just want to say a special thank you to my wife, Yesenia, who was up here. Wasn't she the best? We're actually going to be celebrating one year of marriage in a few days. I love you. And I just want to give a special thank you to my P12 leader, Pastor Marco Garcia, in the building. Come on, let's really hear it for our pastor who believes in discipleship and mentorship. Thank you so much, Pastor Marco. Today, I'm here today to introduce you into a lifelong relationship with a God that loves you, a God that cares for you. And I know how much he loves you because he sent his son to die for you. Today, I'm gonna teach you exactly how he wants you to follow him and ultimately what that means for your life. Tonight, you're gonna hear things that may not be very popular, but they are promises that have eternal value for you. We're gonna learn, and this is a title, how to become a true disciple. Look at someone next to you and say, I wanna be a true disciple. That word disciple means this. It's a leader or a follower of Jesus. It's a person that willingly operates under the rule of Jesus in everyday life. It's someone who allows Jesus to dictate their decisions. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Look at verse, starting from verse 16. It says, the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. And I want to bring up that point because I feel like some of us, we're here, we're excited, we're going to worship God. But some people have come tonight with questions on their mind. I'm here to let you know that God desires a relationship with you and God desires to help you to grow in your spiritual journey, in your walk with him. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Shout out. We had some P12 leaders baptizing their own disciples tonight during service. Let's hear it for our new disciples. Teach these new disciples. I love that. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always even to the end of the age. Tonight's sermon is gonna be broken up into three parts. Part number one, the problem. Part number two, the price. And part number three, the promise. We're gonna talk about the problem we're facing today, the price that comes with discipleship, but the promise behind discipleship. Let's start by talking about the problem. I think the main problem we're seeing today not just in the, in the church, I believe in the country, maybe even in the world, is we've created converts and members, but not disciples and disciple makers. What does that mean? People have been taught that God is a check in with me on Sunday type of God, but people have not been taught that God is a surrender your entire life to me, God. See, the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. There was a very big problem that Jesus noticed. Jesus traveled through all the towns and the areas. He was teaching. He was announcing the good news. He was healing every kind of sick, disease, and illness. He was doing all this ministry. But 36 says, verse 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest 
who was in charge of the harvest, ask him to send more workers into his field. Did you know that Jesus is more concerned about your spiritual condition than about your physical condition? It says here that he was healing the sick, but even with their sicknesses being healed, he still had compassion on them. In other words, he was heartbroken for their condition. You would think that Jesus would be excited that he had crowds of people following him as the Messiah, getting their sicknesses healed, getting money in their bank account, prospering and getting excited and being happy, but there was still a problem. They had a spiritual condition. That word compassion literally means he felt it in his gut. Is there ever, any, ever everything you've experienced in life that you feel it in your gut? It just, it can't escape you? Things are going on in life and you're at work, but you still feel this, this, this tension in your stomach, like there's a pain in your heart. That's what Jesus felt when he saw the crowds of people. He was heartbroken with pity and with empathy for the people of God. This might surprise you, this statement, but Jesus cares more that you're being discipled just about you getting physical healing and getting physical miracles. See, in this condition, the people were tired. They were lonely. They were lost because they didn't have discipleship. It says in verse 36, they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Other versions say they were weary, they were scattered, they were harassed by the enemy. That's all the way to say that they just felt like giving up. The other day, my wife and I, we went to a store and as we were there, we we're talking to one of the, the people, one of the workers at the store and we began to talk to them about church and inviting them. Her name is Rebecca. She's a young girl, she's about 20 years old, working two jobs, wants to go to the Navy. She has a lot of dreams and aspirations. And we asked her, do you go to church anywhere? She says, no, I used to, I grew up in church. But I stopped going. All of my family are pastors, but they're all fake. They're not real. So I stopped going to church. It's crazy to think that, that just because she witnessed someone that claimed to be a Christian but wasn't a disciple, she decided to leave God. She based her, her walk on somebody else's relationship with the Lord. What does that tell me? That tells me that people, they're hurting, they're lost, and they're broken, but what they're looking for is some real disciples of Jesus Christ. They're looking for someone that doesn't just talk the talk, but they're looking for someone that says, I'm willing to surrender everything to follow Jesus. People are confused when we preach something, but we don't live it. Who would want to follow Jesus with that kind of example? These people that Jesus were looking at were overwhelmed with the sense of loneliness and helplessness with no one to lead them. There's a problem today. 41% of Americans reported an increase in loneliness since the pandemic hit. Did you know it's still possible to be around people and still feel very lonely? I hear a lot of yeses in there. You know, it's possible to come through these church doors every single week and still feel like you're all alone. Why is that? Why are we seeing this happening today? See, when we don't have someone to personally disciple us, we don't have a sense of direction or belonging in life. The problem isn't that there aren't enough Christians. The problem is that there aren't enough disciples and disciple makers in this world. Jesus tells them the harvest is great, but the workers are few. See, we need to be more than just a witness. We need to become a worker in the field. We need to be someone that's willing to put in the work, to disciple, to care for, to love, to be there in the thick, in the high times and in the low times, in the good times and in the bad for somebody that needs it. I believe, I know today there's a decline in church membership, not in our church, but I believe in overall America there's a stat. But why? It's because we focus more on self-help rather than true discipleship. But that ends tonight. Tonight we're saying we're gonna be true disciples that follow Jesus no matter what. So we, we express the problem. Now let's talk about the price. 
There's no such thing as cheap discipleship. There's no such thing as discipleship on a discount. It comes with the cost. Jesus didn't hold back in pain for our sins. Jesus didn't pull any, pull any, hold anything back. He gave it all on the cross for us. And he's letting us know t- tonight that there's a, there's a price for discipleship. Look at Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25. Now you would think that if you got in front of a big crowd of people, um, J- Jesus will have an opportunity to preach. And he would, he would say, hey guys, welcome. Um, we're so glad you're here tonight. It's good to see you. Um, we have a lot of great things in store for you. But this is what Jesus decides to say. And this is crazy. This isn't something you hear all the time. But Jesus gets a whole crowd. And this is what he picks. I'm like, Lord, really that? You could have started with maybe something else. But this is what he decides to say. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Ouch. Like, I'm like, He says, your father, your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you don't carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. The first price of a disciple is true disciples keep God first. True disciples keep God at the throne of their heart. See, we must put Jesus before everything else. And I know this is a strong statement to make if you don't hate your father, your mother, your wife, or children. What is he saying? Here's a translation for modern day. A true disciple makes God at number one in their heart with no close second place. My wife knows this. We're going on a year of marriage and she knows this. She's number two in my life, not number one. And I know this about her, that I'm number two in her life. I'm not number one. But I'm a better husband to her when she's number two and God is sitting at number one in my life. I'll be a, I'll be a better father for our future kids. That's not an announcement, I'm just saying. I'll be a father to our future kids when God is number one in my life. When I have my priorities in order, everything else seems to take care of itself. However, if I have someone that competes with the throne of God, the throne in my heart, then that's when my life seems to come to disarray. I start to see my life getting fragmented. I start to see my direction getting distorted. I start to see my desires getting twisted and deceived. And sooner or later, I start to, in my mind, justify why everything else is more important than God in my life. See, a true disciple says, God, you're number one before my mom, before my dad, before my kids, before my spouse. You are number one because, Lord, without you, I have nothing. I am nothing. I can do nothing. I can't be a good man, a good woman. I can't do anything good unless I have you, Jesus. You're my everything. You're the reason I'm alive. You're the reason I'm breathing today. You're the reason I'm saved. You are my everything, Jesus, and nobody comes close to you. Someone, let's just say this to the, to the Lord. Let's say, no one comes close to you, Lord. That includes yourself. See, a true disciple puts Jesus before themselves. When Jesus says, pick up your cross, he's not just saying, wear a cross on your neck or put a bumper sticker on your car. Although I'm really proud to see people putting Jesus everywhere in the car. That's awesome, you know, except when they're cutting people off and they got the wayward outreach bumper sticker. Big old Jesus loves you. Then I'm like, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. That's not, what put it, that's not what picking up our cross is. Picking up our cross means leaving everything to follow Jesus. It means, if it means putting Jesus before me, it means I can't turn back to my old life. It's gone, it's crucified on the cross. Putting yourself on the cross, picking up your cross literally means that I am not turning back. 
I'm not going back to my old ways, my old sin, my old temptation, my old way of thinking, my old relationships, that old phone number. I am not going back. I'm not leaving room for it. I'm not leaving the door cracked. I am shutting the door and putting it, nailing it to the cross. There is no turning back. That old me is dead. How many are saying that old you is dead tonight? So a true disciple keeps God first. What else does a true disciple th do? A true disciple will count the cost. Look at verse 28, Luke 14, 28, going back to that portion of scripture. He says, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. Anyone ever ran out of money before? Well... And then everyone would laugh at you. That's not fun. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Ah! <laughs> See, when we're talking about being willing to pay, uh, count the cost, what we're saying is a true disciple will know that it costs everything. See, I can't go halfway. I can't build a halfway tower, and I can't become a halfway Christian. Too many times, the problem is not all the things we're dealing with. The problem is that we are a halfway Christian. We got a halfway connection with God. I got a halfway commitment to the Lord. I got a half yes and a half no. I got a yes on Sundays and a no six days out of the week. See, a true disciple of Jesus says this, I say yes with my mouth, and I mean it with my life. I count the cost. Luke, 4, Luke 6, 46 says this, check this out. Why do you keep on saying that I'm your Lord when you refuse to do what I say? It's like God is, it's like almost like, I know God's never confused, but I picture that a rhetorical question. He's like, why do you keep calling me Lord if I'm not your Lord? I don't understand, why, why would you continue to tell me that I am the ruler and the master of your life when you haven't even let me make a decision for you on Monday morning? How, how, can, I, how can we say these, Lord? And what God is saying today, that I'm calling you into a place of true discipleship where no longer will you have to lead your own life and try to figure this out on your own. God is saying, let me sit at the driver's seat of your heart. Let me dictate where you go and what you say. And I promise you this, you are gonna build this tower. We're gonna build on your purpose. We're gonna build in your life and in your ministry. Don't be a halfway Christian. Be an all the way Christian. Count the cost and realize it costs everything. Someone say, it costs everything. The third price of being a true disciple. True disciples are willing to fight. Someone say, I'm a fighter. Going back to that same portion of scripture, verse 31. It says, or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000? The soldiers that are marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss his terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciples without giving up everything you own. What is he saying? We gotta be willing to go to war. We gotta be willing to fight. But here's the thing. I know this, that we are, we may be outnumbered in this world, but we are not overcome in Jesus' name. This means that you're willing to go to fight and fight a war that only God can help you win. This is the kind of war that we cannot win based on our own strength, based on our own willpower, and based on our own decision making. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be a true disciple that fights this fight. What are we fighting? We're fighting our old temptations. We're fighting our own sin. We're fighting against the principalities of darkness. Did you know that the enemy is okay with churchgoers coming in and out of church just as long as he can make a peace treaty with you that you will never become a disciple? The enemy is okay. He's like, okay, let's put these terms on the table. I'll give you church on Sundays, even Wednesdays. Here's my conditions. You can never let that, this God stuff seep into your everyday life. 
I'm okay with that. Keep going to church. You're to dress up nice. You could even go up there at the altar and jump around. It'd be awesome. You could even sing on the worship team. You could even preach on stage. You could do all of that. But just as long as you're not a real disciple uh, Monday through Friday. See, we're signing peace treaties with the enemy, but there's no such thing as negotiating with the enemy. The enemy is here to steal, kill, and destroy. We don't give God six days out of the week and say, God, it's, you know, it's the majority of my week. No, we give God our every single day, and every day we have to fight this fight. I'm not here to tell you it's going to be easy merry-go-round. I'm here to let you know that every day it will be a fight, but it's a fight where God is on your side. He is the general of your army, and as a matter of fact, all you got to do is stand behind the Lord and let him fight your battles for you. I'm not going back to the old me. I'm not going to cuss that person out. I'm not going to go back to the bottle. I'm not going back to the old relationships. I'm fighting a fight, and I know my soul is on the line. God, I need you to go before me in Jesus' name. A true disciple fights Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Friday night, Sunday all day. A true disciple does not throw in the towel when it gets tough. A true disciple stays in the ring and is willing to fight, is willing to press, and is willing to push through. Do I got any true fighters and disciples here tonight? You can't be neutral in this war either. You got to take a stand. The fourth price of a true disciple. True disciples are willing to make an impact. Someone say, I'm an impact maker. Going back to that same portion of scripture, Luke 14, go to verse 34. It says salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile it's thrown away it's not even good enough for a manure pile hey, that's a low blow Jesus anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand I want everyone to practice what we learned on Sunday I want you to lean in really quick listen to this he's saying this true disciples make an impact. In other words, true disciples change their environment. I love Brittany's testimony. She was an environment changer. She was saying, there's someone at my job we, we all had a tough time with. We can't really get along. She was difficult to deal with. I know you're probably already thinking of someone at your job. You're like, I'm dealing with the same thing. But what does Brittany decide to do? Brittany says, I'm going to change this whole attitude that everyone has towards her. I'm going to change the environment. Not only does she take it upon herself, but she gets a group of people together. And she says, it's her birthday. Let's get her a cake. Let's, let's bless her. Let's shower her with love. Wait, that don't make no sense. She, she doesn't shower us with love. If anything, she talks behind her back and, and she doesn't get along. She doesn't say hi to us. She don't deserve my love. Well, what do you think I'm going to give her love? All of us would have said that. But Brittany says, I'm the salt of the earth. I make an impact in my environment. I got flavor. I got some flavor. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change this environment and I'm going to shower her with love. And you know what happens when true disciples are willing to shine and be salt of the earth? People come to know the Lord. Now her coworker is tearing up and is wondering, what is this love I'm experiencing? This unconditional love. I didn't deserve this love, but I'm getting this love. What is going on? And all Brittany has to say is it's Jesus. It's the Lord. And now she's here tonight in service with Brittany. Let's give God praise for that. True disciple makes an impact. Don't become a worthless Christian. Oof. What does that mean? That means that your kin kingdom impact just depends on your discipleship commitment. The less commitment the less commitment I have of being a true disciple, the less impact I have in the kingdom. 
But the more commitment I have to being a true disciple, the more impact I have in the kingdom. We learned about the problem. We learned about the price. Now I want to talk to you about the promise. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. God has certain promises that are designated for true disciples. These are blessings that are attached to people who accept the call to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Number one, freedom. Someone say freedom. freedom. We all heard this, this, this verse. I'm sure you guys know it. Um, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you. Free. We know that verse. Do we know the verse right before it? This is what it says, John 8, 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples. Truly my what? If you follow my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That promise of freedom is attached to being a disciple that follows the commands of Jesus Christ. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Because I can't, I can't live however I want to live and expect to be free from the bondages of sin and death in my life. True freedom is for true disciples. We often hear that scripture and we don't realize that he's talking to people who are saying, I'm following the teachings of Jesus. My question to you is this, what area of your life do you need freedom? I have a solution. Follow Jesus. Truly come to know him. Follow his teachings and his word. Get disciple tonight. Join a Power 12 growth group and let your life be totally consumed by his word and you will experience freedom like you never have in your life before. I believe there's some people that I, and here's the thing, I love that we're a church, we come to the altar and we get saved and we get an impact with God, which is powerful, but that's just where it begins. We need to get to the point now where we're not just repenting and then repenting and then repenting we get to a point where we say that's it I'm done with that I'm not going back to that I'm going to get discipled and I'm going to make God a part of my everyday life <laughs> then we'll see freedom in our life like we've never seen before you want to kick that addiction get discipled Going back to Britney's testimony, I love it. She was smoking cigarettes every single day from the age of 18 to 28. She joined a power of 12 and instantly stopped smoking cigarettes. I'm not saying it's gonna happen day one, but I promise you this, God makes a promise of freedom for people that are willing to be discipled. Someone say freedom. freedom. What's the second promise? Someone say fruitfulness. John 15, 8 says this, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. True disciples bear much fruit. This means that you can see tangible results of following Jesus in your life. No one can truly say that they follow Jesus without actually seeing the evidence in their life. God God's principles and his laws and his promises can, can always be counted on. God's principles are so sure that we know and you will know you're a true disciple because you start to see the manifestation in your life. All of a sudden, I didn't cuss that person out. I said, God bless you. That was weird. You know, you start looking in the mirror and you're thinking, what's wrong with me? We start to see the evidence of the fruit come out of your life. All of a sudden your spouse does that thing that used to get on your nerves. I'm not talking about you, my love. I'm just thinking <laughs> she doesn't. She's the sweetest thing in the world. <laughs> if anything, that's me. And all of a sudden you're extra patient and loving. You're like, I actually think that's kind of cute now. What's wrong with me? Something's changing inside. True disciples are fruitful. 
fruitful in their love, their gentleness, their kindness, their patience, their self-control. I now no longer have to binge watch TV just to get escape my depression. Now I'm full of joy and excitement and I'm worshiping the Lord. Now, now I don't have to go back to the bottle. I got some self-control. Now I'm a little more patient when someone's not patient with me. Now I'm a little more loving. I start to see it spewing out of me. I'm bearing fruit in my life. I'm seeing it change me from the inside out. I, I'm a different person. How many want to be fruitful, Christian, in here? Third promise, filled with joy. Someone say joy. joy. Say it with a smile. Say joy. joy. John 15, 11 says, I told you these things. I've given you these commands, in other words, so that you will be filled with my what? Joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. The depression the loneliness that we've been talking about, the anxiety, the anger within our heart, all of that that we're dealing with in the millions, I'm talking millions of people in this country are dealing with these things. All of that can be cured with this one solution, doing what Jesus says. I can, my depression, all of these things. Maybe you came into this room tonight. Maybe you came in here with these pains, with these hurts, with the weariness with the helplessness, no sense of purpose or direction. Today I wanna to offer you the kind of joy that spills over into your everyday life, not only in your life, but in other people's lives. And it's in this term here, it's in discipleship. I'm not saying you're gonna be Ned Flanders in here. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Extra chipper every day and you did a league, you know, like. I'm not saying you're going to be a weird, you know, person, but I am saying that you're going to have the type of joy that gives you strength to keep on going and not give up when things get tough. How many know what I'm talking about? you got a storm that comes your way and hits you, but you know what? I got joy. Praise the Lord. I know God's got my back. You know what? I'm facing a little car trouble today. I normally would have flipped out, but God, you know, God's got me. I'm good. We're going to make it today. Man, you know what, my boss was a, a little extra today. You know what, God is good. I love the Lord, I love my boss. Let's just keep it going. I got a joy within me, I can't stop. I'm excited about the next level. I got vision of where I'm going. I don't know what it is, I just got some joy. Maybe life isn't perfect right now and maybe no one got it all together. I don't got it all together, but I got me some joy. How many want some joy up in here tonight? I got joy. See, this is all released when we make that decision to follow Jesus. We can't do this on our own. As a matter of fact, God won't allow you to succeed alone. He's called us into a life of discipleship. He's called us to be shepherded. He's called us to be mentored. He's called us to be discipled. But we gotta accept the call of discipleship. Tonight, the church is being called into a place of discipleship. Here's a big question. Who is discipling you? Who is discipling you? Because I promise someone is discipling you right now. Have we left our lives to be discipled by Satan himself? Have I just given, and you want to know how I do that? When I refuse to be discipled, by Jesus, by a mentor, by a, a godly leader, then all I could, the only place, the only person, the only master, the only other option is the enemy. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. You either love God and, and hate, the, uh, hate the enemy or, or the other way around. Question is who is discipling you? John 13, 17 says this. It's the last scripture I'm gonna give you. Lean into this one for me. Practice this. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Now that you heard this sermon, now that you know what the problem is and what the price is and the promise is of true discipleship, God will bless you for doing them. Your next step is to accept the call to become a true disciple. I want every P12 leader to stand up every power 12 leader, and I don't want anyone to leave. All the power 12 leaders, I want you to stand up on your feet. 
all the P12 leaders, let's stand up, let's stand up, let's stand up. Let's give them a round of applause. I know we got more than that. Where are P12 leaders at? P12 leaders, I want the P12 leaders to stay standing and I want you guys to find an area, maybe the altar. We have some tables right there in the center aisles. Right now we have P12, go ahead, you can make your way out of your seat. Make your way out of your seat, P12 leaders. And I want you to find an aisle or find one of the tables that are right there, right next to your, uh, your aisle, right there. This is what we're gonna do. These are power 12 leaders that are willing, all the P12 leaders, let's go, all the P12 leaders. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna make a call to discipleship tonight. And tonight we're saying, I wanna be truly discipled. I wanna give my life to Jesus and I wanna follow him like I never have before. All the leaders in their stations, now I want all of us to stand to our feet. Let's all stand up tonight. We're making a call tonight. The big question is, who is discipling you? Who is discipling you? How, how many by show of hands, you need to be discipled? You need to be discipled. You're not being discipled right now and you need to be, and you're ready to be discipled. I see hands going up. I see some hands going up. I see your hand right there. I see your hand, I see your hand. Really quick, by show of hands, how many are being discipled right now? You're in a power of 12. You're in a power of 12. It's awesome. Come on, that's awesome. We got some disciples in the building tonight. Tonight we're going to make a call. If you're ready to be discipled and you're ready to make this stand to say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be a true disciple of Jesus. I want you to make your way out of your seat. Find what, and come up here to this altar. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna congratulate you. We're gonna be with you, we're gonna stand with you. And we're gonna be there to support you in every single step in your, jersey, in, your, in, your, in your journey. If you're ready to be discipled tonight, again, by show of hands, you're saying, that's me. I want you to make your way out of your seat. I want you to come up to this altar or find a part 12 leader in the aisle. Come on, we got some people coming up right now. Let's give them a round of applause. Amen. Really quick, by show of hands, how, how many are not in a P12 right now? Really quick, and, and, and this, is not to, this is not to bring any negative exposure. This is to say, I'm ready to get discipled. If you're saying, I want to get discipled. Uh, and P12 leaders, if you see someone raise their hand, kindly introduce yourself to them and say, I want to get to know you. I would love to disciple you. We got a whole crowd of people coming up. You guys can come on up. P12 leaders, if you see someone that you want to get to know, Now's the time to introduce yourself as a leader and say, I'm willing to take that journey with you. Look, we got more people coming up, more people getting connected. We have a whole group of people walking up right here. Come on, church, just give them a round of applause. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God. I want to make another call. If you're here tonight and you're saying, I want to follow Jesus and I, I can't even give my, I, don't, I can't even be a disciple because I, I don't even know if I'm saved. I don't even know if my faith is in Jesus. Tonight, if you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ and you want to make him the Lord of your life, you want to make him number one in your heart. Maybe he's been number two, number three. Maybe he's been last place on your list and you're saying, I'm ready to make him number one in my life, then at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. The Bible says the wages or the price of our sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Jesus died on the cross so we can be saved and forgiven, but we have to repent and turn to him. There will be a day that we will die, and I believe and I pray that when we pass away, we can stand before the Lord and he can say, well done not because of what you have done, but because of what he has done. Let Jesus become the Lord of your life. If you're saying, I wanna give my life to Jesus tonight, I wanna to be forgiven of my sins. I wanna know if I were to die today, I'd go to heaven. At the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hand. Raise your hand all over this place. 
Raise your hand. I see your hands right there. Awesome. Anybody else? I see your hand up here. Awesome. If you raise your hand, I want you to come on up. I want you to come on up. We're going to congratulate you, those that raise your hand. Let's give them a round of applause as they make their way forward. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Let's say a prayer together. We're all, let's all bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. There's still people coming up. There's still people coming up. We're gonna give you guys time. Today we're gonna to say a prayer. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give you everything. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of doing it my way. I'm ready to let it all go. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross and you rose from the, from the dead to give me a new life, to save me. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Make me a new person. And from this day forward, I'm picking up my cross and I'm following you as a true disciple. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, let's give God praise tonight. Tonight we made disciples. In Jesus' name, praise God. Pastor, did you want to say anything? No. We love you, church. We love you guys so much. Remember this, if God is for you, no one can come against you. This Sunday, we're continuing a series, the mo one of the most important series, relationship skills. And we're going to start learning about how to do relationships God's way. Pastor Marco is going to bring an amazing word. Don't miss it this Sunday. Invite somebody. If you want to get connected to a leader, come up to the altar, go up into the aisles. We also have a photo booth outside. If you just joined a P12, we have signs that say, I connected to a P12. You can sign up to lead a Power 12 as well tonight. Just go to the app and click Power 12. You can sign up to lead. We love you, church. Congratulations on becoming a disciple. Have a wonderful night. God bless.